the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first time Stephen King reader. We are here today doing part three, Grown Ups, chapter number 12, three uninvited guests, sections one and two. This chapter was 27 pages, and that is 2.48% of the entire book, and these two sections combined for 9 pages, just 0.83% of the entire book. Henry Bowers, locked up in Juniper Hill since 1958, began to hear voices in the moon. He heard the voices of his long-dead childhood friends, Victor Chris and Belch Huggins. Sent away for murdering his father, Henry was also blamed for the deaths of Victor, Belch, Patrick Hochstetter, and Veronica Grogan. Four voices taunted him, the voices of the losers. Later that night, a still 12-year-old Victor visited the dorm where Henry, his Blue Ward inmate buddies, and his trusty nightlight were sleeping, or trying to. Victor convinced Henry to break out and head back to Derry, to pay him back, promising revenge on the losers. Victor appeared as a Domervan pincher to the guard and helped Henry sneak away. All right, so a lot of things happen in this section. We uh, we hang out with Henry Bowers. Benj, why don't you kick us off here? Yeah, so this takes place the day after Mike uh, made the phone calls to the group uh, and the day before they all arrived. So there was always like a day transfer from the time the calls were made to the time they showed up. So basically, it knew they were coming. It knew uh, he had made the phone calls, and so he started planting the seeds earlier in the day and then chose that night to break them out, to, you know, break them loose. So, Melissa, what do you, what do you think this means as, you know, we've with the, just the quick timeline, because there's a lot of ha- a lot of things going on in this entire chapter with mm-hmm. this date and with the reunion of the losers. It's like all of this kind of overlaps on top of itself, right? The whole chapter eleven and chapter twelve timeline are very it, near. Is it the same day as chapter eleven, or was it the it's, day before, before chapter eleven? It's right before because. Okay. We know that there was... It, this was think, travel day. Right, travel day. Because I think it was like, like two or three days traveling. later. Yeah, exactly. I I think it's interesting that Henry Bowers is going to continue to play a role. I think that was something the first time I read this book, I was like, oh, shit, he's coming back. Okay. Like, I, I bought it and I believed it, but it definitely took me a minute. I mean, because we're halfway through the book now. It's page 583 out of not quite 1100 that's halfway through and all of a sudden bam here comes this kid who we thought was just some jerk from you know some random bully from childhood and now he's back as an adult being broke out of crazy prison and by dead people and like that's when you know like all the stuff in chapter 11 all the the giant statues and the talking clowns those were threats. This is not a threat. This, this is, is direct is action. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's a little scary with Henry because as Vic says, like they have to at least half believe for me to be able to hurt him. But you can hurt him and they don't have to believe at all. Mm-hmm. Pennywise is serious, man. Yeah. He's scared. I, I, I think this is his entrance policy. Okay, you know. I can see that. Bringing, bringing a known contender, a known tool. The way everything, again, this is the first time I've ever read this book and Every time we get a lot of more, a lot more insight into the Bowers and Huggins and Chris group oh, here yeah. on, you know, things that we've been hearing about coming up, you know, the whatever this final showdown below the city is, whatever this apocalyptic rock fight is going to be. We keep hearing all about these things, but it's interesting getting this kind of after the fact before we hear the story uh, thought process by Bowers here of. <laughs> Like, hey, I don't want to talk about that, the rock fight, you know, and all these other things that we have seen, because he goes through about three or four different story elements that we've seen three of them. We've seen Ben get away. We've seen the the, the fight with uh, Bev, Ben, and uh, Richie. Richie. 
and but we haven't seen the rock fight. We haven't seen the fight down below the city. But so it's like I, I know there's no lying here. These are things that are absolutely happening. It's just interesting to see Bowers is kind of afraid of being used as a tool again, which is clearly what seems to have happened. He saw some things, and it it's made him what he is today, <laughs> at least in the story that we see. Yeah, no, definitely, and. It, it's kind of one of those of, you know, he's able to justify, you know, how the belt ended up in his room and how the underwear or and how the books, because they were friends, they probably just didn't give a damn about any, where any of their school books went. That makes sense why that ended up there. But how did the underwear? But he's like, but I know who is responsible or what. But you don't think about those. We don't talk about those. Best to just, just dummy up. Yeah, best to just dummy up. Well, I want to talk about that for a second. So the idea that Henry Bowers, who we saw evil crazy like big man like i'm gonna be the tough leader guy henry bowers that same summer basically he was like okay i'll say i did it okay they need a scapegoat okay that's my role okay because if i don't say yes then something worse is gonna happen to me like it's the most it's ironic that in the police station 12 year old henry is the most rational henry we've seen in the book that includes crazy locked up adult Henry. That includes crazed child, like end of school year summer Henry, that he just seems so rational of, oh, yeah, no, I didn't really kill him, but I did. So it's cool. Uh, yep, I did it. Yep, I, no problem. I, I guess can, I didn't. I can say yes to this. I didn't view that because I, I caught that too. Like it's interesting his character in that spot is so different than everything else that we've seen. Right. I don't look at it as being rational. I look at it as being completely defeated mentally by whatever he had just gone through. Seeing Victor and, uh, God, I was Chris, Belch, Vic, Belch, Belch and Victor, whatever mm-hmm. happened to them breaks him. I mean, just flat out. So I'm he just saying, doesn't even care anymore. I'm not saying he is rational. I'm saying this is the closest he ever gets to appearing to be rationally making decisions. That he is the least chaotic version that we've seen of him. Is that fair? Yes, because at that point he was just like, okay, whatever, fine. So I fine. do have a theory on it. I don't know if this, I don't think, because we, we know that the losers were somewhat successful in 58 for doing something to hinder it. I have a feeling that it may be all tied together in the timeline wise that once they, uh, took care of the problem, it lost its control on Henry, and he actually wisened, and that released him a bit from the anger, from the craze, uh, craze, and made him realize Mm. they need a scapegoat, uh, and it makes sense, you know, I, yeah, they have, you know, fine, yep, I did it, you know, they have me dead rights, so I'm not gonna fight it. I think Luke, yeah, you you might be a little bit onto something, he's broken from what he saw, but I'm gonna play up that, because I've been hearkening on this the whole time, that it has a lot more effect on the negative, you know, on people just like uh, from chapter two, uh, where I don't think any of the boys would have actually killed Adrian Mellon, you know, had it not had its influence factoring through him. And I think that plays into a lot of what Henry is going through. And once that was released, he wisened up. And I don't disagree with you, Bench, because I mean, at one point when he was saying, yes, he had killed Patrick. Yes. To Veronica. Yes. One. Yes. All not true, but it didn't matter. Blame needed to be taken. Perhaps that was why he had been spared. And if he refused, and yeah. it trails off. So yeah, he's, that's probably the most rational thought he has is if I don't say it, like what the police are going to do to me is nothing compared to what could happen. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's. I had a lot of thoughts during this, like, cause there's, this is the first time we've been in Henry's head, and mm-hmm. yeah, it's all over the place, and we know a lot of his character already, and we've seen his character, but I, I guess I do kind of get sh- a little bit more rational thoughts than I would have anticipated, so I, I'm pulling back my previous statement, I, I, I'm coming around on what you were saying, Melissa, he is actively thinking through, you know, weighing these options, where everything else we've seen from him is just, in the heat of the moment, decision or not decision, right. he's actually thinking, and there's no passion, there's no, it's, okay, well, I know what will happen to me if I don't just become this scapegoat for it, and that seems way, way worse than just letting this happen, and, oh yeah, sure, um, yeah, I killed my dad, uh, yeah, the belt, yeah, I, I killed Patrick Hockstetter too, you know, that makes sense. I'm your guy. That's me. Add it to the list. Yeah, let's yeah, make I'm, this go quick and painless because I'm done. Yeah, I'm Belch and Victor. They're my fault because I made him go down. Mm-hmm. I did like 
the throw off comment in the book that 58 was a big year for murder trials. Did anybody else catch that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because they're talking about the father uh, that was also in 58 had, oh, I'm trying to remember who else popped up uh, that we know of. At this it was point. Eddie Corcoran's. Eddie Corcoran's that's, stepdad. That's, that's the dad. I'm, yeah, right. the dad I'm thinking of. Uh, trying to think of who else went on trial, but can't think of them off the top of my head. But yeah, I did catch that uh, note, Melissa. It had been a famous year for murder trials, all right. When it came to murder trials, 1958 had been a pip. <laughs> <laughs> it's a random line about oh yay murder trials it's like 96 with oj simpson around here right like, yeah yay it was a big one so, all right can, can we talk about the moon yeah yeah so do you guys know what a ghost moon is well the book says it's when you can see the moon in daytime yeah so that's not a real thing like it, it's it's a very it's a poetic uh thing that he's like, doing there calling it that yeah. um it's because like i i heard it and i didn't hear him because again i'm just going through the audiobook and i missed him referencing you know he saw it in the daylight a ghost moon so i hear the ghost moon and then i start i started paying attention i'm like well, what the hell is that so i quickly google it nothing comes up it's like <laughs> it like brings you all into like lens parallax stuff and like, really? like double moon type things and i'm like ah, this is this is not a, a cosmological term you know it's not like the hunter's moon or like you know, like any of those like blue moon like it's not like one of those uh no. seasonal type things it was just a. Uh, and once I, and I actually went back and was saying my notes i i read through it just to highlight things i saw that was like oh if I just would have stayed with the fucking book, I would have got there right away. Right. It's basically like Henry's, I mean, let's be honest, he never had schooling past 12. And even the schooling he had up through 12 wasn't very good. You know what I mean? His uneducated, very twisted and kind of deranged mind naming something a little different than you're used to. Yeah, yeah. I liked it, though. Because once it yeah. was described as pale, you know, up in the sky where you normally wouldn't see the moon. Like, it was, I liked it. It's a good, good term. So let's get on to, uh, so he, he, he's using the hoe, right? And uh, they're, they're working on the peas, right? And um, the counselors, quote unquote counselors is what they're, they're called. They're really more like COs, right? Uh, correctional yeah. officers. And um, they carry rolls of quarters because those are non-fatal weapons. Yep. That's just fucking awful. But um, And also not true. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they all hit in the exact same spot, right in the back of the neck, which, yeah, fine, it's not going to kill you, but that will paralyze anyone. Like you, true, fine, yes. <laughs> it, <laughs> it just sounds painful. <laughs> no, it, yeah, but if you hit right in that right spot, oh yeah, you're you're paralyzing like we see later in the, you know, chapter about right. uh, about Arlen, uh, yep. you know. Yep, Arlen Weston, who starts having convulsions later on. Um, yeah, so and. I want to talk about the the other mental patients as well in a minute, but the main thing that I really picked up on this, and I see that Benji has a very similar note, um, it's always a group of three for these bullies or whatever these are. You know, in Chapter 2, we had Webby, Unwin, and Dubay. Uh, Every other time with the 1958 kids, it's always been Bowers and Huggins and Chris. And now we've got this Fogarty, Adler, and Koontz, who are the worst three of them all. And it sounds like the other officers or whatever were probably pretty bad too. But the fact that it was three specifically that, I mean, hell, this is Bell, this is, uh, this is Bowers calling these guys out. Like they've got to be pretty bad, right? I mean, pretty sadistic in their treatment of, of their patient, their uh, patients. Yeah. Because, well, a couple things I have, uh, cause I saw your note and that's where I kind of built my note off of. Uh, but going into that, that mindset, especially back in the day, this is, uh, 1985. So before the shutdown of a lot of the state run asylums and everything where people were just kind of tucked away. Yeah. The people who couldn't get a job as a police officer, as a correction officer, well, you can go deal with the crazies. And usually there's a reason why you weren't allowed to be a police officer or a correctional officer because you have anger issues or anything like that. To put them with that because uh, the mentally handicapped and mentally challenged are always the highest victims of assault and sexual assault and just mishandlings and everything because no one's going to believe them. Who cares? So they put the psychos in control of them. And it, you know, so yeah, when, when Henry Bowers is calling out, you know, uh, the corrections officers or the, you know, whatever they're called, you know, yeah, that is saying something because he's never seen anything that bad. And he's been, you know, like the worst of the worst that we've seen as a kid, but even they're worse than what he could have imagined. He, If he not gone to jail, he probably would have grown up to be one of them, is an easy I agree thing. with that, but I wonder, since he 
kid, he's probably a lot softer. Yeah. Would have been, don't you think? Oh, Sorry, yeah, I'm absolutely. Completely the subject. I, no, Go back. I think it's, Go. I think it fits both the conversations that we've had. I think after whatever Pennywise does, he is softer. So he doesn't fit that mold like he did mm-hmm. before that. He was big dog. And then he saw a true vicious dog with Pennywise. Is I'm what I'm rephrase my word. I don't want to call it softer. I want to call it broken. Sorry. Yes. Yes. I completely agree. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, and now going to your other note, Luke, of the power of three uh, with the three bullies. Right before right before we jump on that, one thing that I wanted to touch on with the sure. mental um, asylums and things like that. If you've never read Catch-22 story, do it. There are some really, really cool things in there. Well, not cool. Interesting topics that I think kind of fit into the treatment that we were just getting at. So okay. definitely check that check that book out. So going uh, to your point of the power of three uh, with the three bullies, I was uh, I had to make sure to stop and count uh, all the people that were named during uh, the hoe towing. Uh, And you have uh, you have Henry Bowers, first of all, number one. George DeVille, who murdered his wife, Jimmy Donlin, who killed and ate his mother, Benny Billy, uh, pyromaniac. Franklin Del Cruz, who raped over 50 women aged 3 to 81. Arlen Weston, who's a bit slow because he got hit a little too hard back in the day. And one that gets cut off because we don't get the answer. Because, uh, right, uh, yeah, at, at least one more is how yeah, I read so that. There's seven. There's seven versus three, which are both prime, magical, mystical, you know, mm-hmm. pr- prime numbers kind of thing that, you know, it, it's, and I think it's a playoff of what you were saying, where there's always three bullies, there's seven together that maybe they could help each other. Seven victims that can, yeah. that can work together. Yeah. Makes me worried that we don't have Stan. <laughs> oh, Stan. So. Can I just make fun of Henry's teeth for a minute? Go for it. So there's a lot the of young, teeth talk in this chapter. There was. Um, they, they started falling out and rotting when he was 14. First of all, what the hell happened to him at 14? Like, I get that he was all in prison or locked up in, what was it, Juniper Hill or something, but dude, come on, like, you're 14. What, what you've been doing to your teeth? Although it's Henry, so probably not doing a lot of self-care beforehand. But the description of them, um, it says they looked like the pickets in a fence outside a haunted house. So not only were they yellowed, they were also falling down and crooked and, quite yeah. frankly, a little scary. So dental health, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, it's really worth it. And so to that point, Melissa, really quick, I, that brings me to think back to Bev's ch- last chapter, her last section, where she says it's not uncommon for people in the Northeast or in this area to negate their dental care and everything, especially people of that age, which would tie into uh, Henry being not really taught dental care and everything. And as one as I can speak, if you're genetically predisposed, <laughs> has a predisposition for bad teeth, sometimes you just can't help it. So, yeah, actually, you know, I forgot about the, uh, yeah. the the witch, the candy candy yeah. witch, uh, bad teeth. That's uh, another one that very recent. And I'm trying to think back if there's been other. I know uh, Ben's big scary thing with the reunion was the mm-hmm. teeth, and he's had a focus on teeth a few times. So yeah, it's which I think that's one of those like really really common fears in dreams that people have is their teeth falling mm-hmm. out. I mm-hmm. can't say I've ever had that, but I hear it's highly highly common. Um, so I don't know. I, I think just kind of playing on some primal fears that people have by bringing that in pretty pretty interesting. Um, so. I'm actually going to get to the line real quick here, but it's basically whenever. Oh, I know, I, I know, I highlighted it. The coming through the mist, or coming like coming in like when, mist when the lights are off. That's why he has the, uh, the night, night light. lights. Yeah, do you see that line? I apparently don't. Give me a second. George DeVille. With no light, things could come on, could come in. The locks on the door and the wire mesh did not stop them. They came like mist. Things. They talked and laughed. And sometimes they clutched hairy things, smooth things, things with eyes, the sort of things that had really killed Vic and Belch when the three of them had chased the kids into the tunnels under Derry in August of 1958. Yeah. So this was like, I think, the first indication through through this section that that those three bullies, you know, uh, had their their big part to play in whatever happens moving forward. And Bowers is is tormented by this still like it. He still remembers. All of these characters forget things. I mean, he might not know the specifics. He doesn't, he seems to, but I think he does. I think he remembers what happened. 
he all chooses of our heroes. to actively ignore it. But, he, but yeah. if he thought about it for a second, he would know mm -hmm. it. It's not, mm -hmm. he doesn't have the fish scales that all of our heroes besides Mike have had. Right. And I, I find that very, very interesting that he is constantly and, aware of it and uh, has to live in that as part of his kind of long torment. And even as Mike has said, he's forgotten up until like a couple of years ago. He right. forgot most of it. So, but mm -hmm. Henry never did. Right. You know, he might have been kind of sedated out of him or shock treatmented out of him uh, for a time, but it's never left him. Right. Yeah. I don't think it was like a, he was prevented from knowing it. It was more of a, he was unconscious and not, not, didn't really actually have a physical chance, if that makes sense. Can we just talk about the nightlights for a second? <laughs> yeah, those were cute, huh? They're adorable. Donald Duck, Mickey and Minnie, Oscar the Grouch, Fozzie Bear. I'm down. Where can I get those? <laughs> Juniper Hill. Personally, I would really like an Oscar the Grouch. It's I think that would be out of the four. That would be the one that I would really like. Maybe something to add to our dairy <laughs> shopping center. Sure, go right ahead. All right, we're gonna have a, a, an ongoing list on the side here, so we don't forget. <laughs> Put it in the Slack chat. Add nightlights. <laughs> uh, so uh, I liked, uh, you know, Belch comes in and uh, Belch. He's, oh, I'm, well, no, uh, Victor. Uh, no, okay, now I'm thinking of Belch in the in the moon. Sorry, uh, when oh, Belch uh, was talking to yeah. him. Ah, the talking moon. Yeah, the talking, the talking moon. moon. Uh, and even Belcher's ghost can't get over that damn home run, you know. <laughs> right, it's, I know. It's, you know, it's like, just one. Even one even Tracker. Okay, I have to say this. It's literally like Stephen King is like, okay, I have nothing else to do with this kid. He has absolutely no defining qualities. He has nothing that has him stand out from just being like Crap and Goyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Like just yeah. your typical lackeys behind the. Like, okay, what can we do? What can we do? I know about halfway through the book, he finally came up with an idea that can be Belch's like, or sorry, Belch's like thing. So weird. I don't get the same thing from Chris. I feel like Chris has some depth. Victor Chris has some depth to it. It's just Belch is, yeah. is like yeah. that. Because Victor Chris just feels like a typical kid who fell in the wrong crowd. Belch feels dumb. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. It was early in chapter three. I believe. Orange chapter. Yeah, the the introductions chapter. Mm -hmm. One of them specifically calls out Victor Chris as being more of a problem than any of the others, specifically to that kid. No, I know, I, I know that, I know that Ben had a big, big problem with Henry Bowers, and he goes into depth on that. I, I think Victor you're Chris incorrect. I think you're thinking of Patrick Hoss Hockstetter. I don't think we've done anything with Patrick yet. No, but I think he's been meant. He was mentioned he's as mentioned. worse. I think, I think you might be getting it confused. Uh, Victor Chris was the first of the bullies that was ever mentioned. He was the first one named because I, that that name stuck with me first. Okay. Is the only reason I'm even combating combating it at all. Um, I really don't want to dwell on it. But my point is, Victor Chris seems like there's he has more character depth to him, which that's that's all I really wanted to get at. And I was curious as to which of the losers uh, had a bigger problem with Victor Chris in general. Might have been Richie. It sounds it sounds right. It, like I don't because he was the I, second. He was the second of all of them, right? It went yeah. Stan and then Richie, and I, I'm pretty sure that it was it was. I Richie. have uh, I have it here uh, because then we Henry, have or, Ben, who then talks about Henry Bowers. Yeah, and on more than one occasion, he had run past it with Henry Bowers and Belch Huggins and the other big boy, Victor, somebody or another, in hot pursuit of all them yelling little pleasantries like "We're gonna get you, fuck face." Hmm. That's the first mention of Victor. Uh, second one, the same uh, Victor Chris. It's, the, it's still the Richie crisis has his mind set up abruptly. His last name was Victor Chris. No, oh, Chris wasn't. Mm. Yeah, so it, it, that's the one that it yeah. is. That it's when he remembers his last. That it just stuck out to me because he really dwells on it. Says it three times. Chris, his mind said sent up abruptly. His last name was Chris. Victor Chris. And so that was like him dwelling on it, and that—that's the only—that's the only thing I'm really getting at. So maybe that's a good deal. Yeah. Benj, what's your so, note there on? <laughs> so I, I think me and Melissa have a, a similar uh, thing. I just looked up at hers, but uh, Kutz's lunch. Okay, so this is like the first food description to make me shudder. Peanut butter and Bermuda onions. Bower, Bowers is uh, right again, and that uh, he should be locked up uh, for being that crazy. So and I think Melissa actually has. The quote was, and they say all the crazy people are locked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, yeah, that is, like, the most disgusting thing I could probably imagine. If, well, add mustard, and then I'd just vomit. So. I like peanut butter. That's about all. Don't ruin peanut butter. 
So we see Bowers getting tormented, right? He, he starts thinking back to the losers, and it seems like he's being specifically tormented by four of them, at least that happened here. None of, very few of them are specifically named, but in the context of what they're saying, I think you can kind of figure out who they're talking about. But uh, it goes from Bill to Ben to Bev, and I believe Mike. Um, I thought in. Richie was in there too. Yeah, Richie was because he called him uh, Banana Heels. That was all in the same one, though. So it starts with you can't catch a fat boy, Ben. But Bob Bowers, you c- couldn't catch a cold, Bill. We got you locked up, asshole. You couldn't. You chased me and you couldn't catch me and I got rich too. Way to go, Banana Heels. Three was Richie. Then the next one was Bev. And I'm not reading that one because I'm not. Yeah. And then the last one is Mike's and I'm not reading those either. Okay. I guess I, the Richie one I was thinking was actually Ben, but that's regardless. No, Ben was first. Either way. I, yeah. I, I guess in my head I had lumped that into Bill's and just yeah. thought that he had chased him another time, but that I hadn't heard of yet. But part of what Bev calls him out for is being potentially impotent. You know, she calls him out that I think you can get where that's going. Yep. And he wouldn't even be able to. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting as to probably something that's going to come up in one of those future big pivotal scenes that I haven't seen yet. Because there seems like there's definitely some truth. If it's coming from Bauer's head, that that's very likely a thing that she would know about. I, or, and, or unless he's just, he has that knowledge in his head now that it, something's not working quite right. Um, and then I, sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, well, if you got something, I do have a thought with that. Uh, just because it made me think, is he more upset up by that because of natural causes or because it was a very common and still is a common practice in mental institutions and criminally insane places to chemically castrate? And so now he's not physically able to. And that's why it really, that, that's another punctuation mark, you know, on him. Just kind of wondering if it was a natural just because of that or if it was a, you know, it was forced upon him. It's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I just want to go back to the point of why do you think it's in his head? I don't that's think true. the moon voices are in his head. I think the moon is talking to him. I think it's really Pennywise because well, it turns in. But does that make clown. it less, <laughs> does that make it real? less real? No, Elvis. My point is, I don't think it's his brain feeding those things necessarily. It could be, or it could really be Pennywise. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, that's... I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with your thought. I'm just saying it isn't necessarily coming from his brain. Although, I I mean, it might be like the whole, like pulling your fears out that's, of peace. Right. But that's kind of where I was going. happening in his brain. Yeah, I think he was absolutely having a Pennywise interaction, but oh, with yeah. that Pennywise is pulling ideas from his head to get into it, which then means that these almost have to be thoughts that Henry has, or at least twist them in a way for him to believe instantly or else it wouldn't be as effective. So that's when I was saying these are thoughts that he's had. I mean, but they're also being applied at Okay. proactively against him as opposed to his brain is manufacturing this conversation yes, yes. okay and so yeah that kind of goes into another harry potter tie-in so now not only is pennywise a bogart bogart but he is also a horcrux pulling thoughts from and using oh, okay. pulling thoughts and using them against i was thinking oh, just, more like a pensive oh fair yeah I was, but all it, three it, have it, that similar characteristic right yeah, Ooh, yeah. Let me, okay jot that down there's some harry potter theories in there i need to start unpacking <laughs> that so <laughs> But I, I'm gonna. Anybody got anything before we get into uh, when uh, Vic Victor starts walking up? Or, I just, I just want to talk about Victor and his head being torn off and sewn back on. I do have. So whenever Bowers finally loses it, shouting at the out at the moon, basically he he just oh, he, yeah. his like mind blows up basically, and then he gets the quarters to the back of the head. But with that, it clearly turns into the clown face at the very end. And he's saying, you know, I need you to go back to Derry, Henry. I need you to go and kill them all. And, oh, man, good stuff. <laughs> and Henry says, no, Henry doesn't want to, you know, or he at least tries. So, again, one, kind of one of the things we talked about on other uh, shows, but uh, he's showing gray. You know, as we're talking about, he owned up to his wrongdoings and took blame for stuff he didn't even do. He's showing a, a grayness at this point where he doesn't want to, you know, listen or he doesn't want to follow. You have to go back, Henry. You have to go back and finish the job. You have to go back to Derry and kill them all. For me. For then Fogarty, who had been standing nearby, yelling at Henry for almost two minutes. And then he, he whacks him. And as he's passing out, he says, kill them all, Henry. Kill them all. 
kill them all. So where where does it say he uh, fights back? I guess I guess I was just misreading it. I, or I misinterpreted it because I, I could be wrong about that. I just kind of where he was shouting at the moon. Yeah. I, I guess that that's where I kind of interpreted he was shouting that he didn't want to. Or Henry begins to scream, not in fury but in mortal terror, and the voice of the clown spoke from the ghost moon. Now, yeah. okay. I, th- I think you could say you know the I, I, I can see where you're coming. From. I think that's a valid thing that he doesn't really want to. I think that's fair. I don't know if I agree, but I can definitely see that interpretation absolutely. So. Um, yeah, so let's get into, um, Victor Chris. What an entrance. Right? Good job. (laughs) I like it. I like the stitched on head. I like that he's still 12. Big fan of the Victor Chris guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's dead and creepy and I don't want to see him. But if you're going to make an entrance, that's the way to go. Yeah, well done. Ben's thoughts here? Uh... Mine kind of goes uh, to later in the, uh, like, towards the end where they're walking out. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump to that in a minute then. Um, yeah, Pennywise definitely seems to be using the Victor Chris uh, puppet pal of uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to convince Bowers to go and finish the job. And this is where the one of the two lines that I think Melissa was kind of referencing earlier comes in. Um, and it, it basically gets into things that we've seen and I have some thoughts moving forward for this, uh, but I can take care of them if they only half believe, he said, but you're alive, Henry. You can get them no matter if they believe, half believe, or don't believe at all. You can get them one by one or all at once. You can pay them back. And just before that, Henry is kind of like, they can't hurt you, Henry said, understanding that he was talking to more than Vic. They can't hurt me if they only half believe, Vic said. But there have been some distressing signs, Henry. We didn't think they could beat us back then either. So we get into this every time we've seen a Pennywise victim show some confidence or fight back. I think that comes into the this discussion of the belief in it, and I don't know which way it falls. The way it's written here, I don't know which way actually works, is if you fully believe or if you don't believe, which one is more detrimental to Pennywise? I think it could be just argued either way, <laughs> from, from what I know right now. Well, so how I take it, just off this particular reading... If they don't believe at all, it doesn't seem like Pennywise can do much to them directly, that he has to use other means to get to them. That's why he's getting Henry. So if the adults don't believe, he's going to get them by using Henry. If they half believe, he can get them himself. And if they fully believe, that's when they can hurt him. Yes. Okay, I'll, uh... You I, I allow think, it? Yeah, no, I think that, that tracks with kind of where I was leaning towards. And the, the one that really kind of um, confused me, or at least kind of threw a, a monkey wrench in my thought process, because I was, I was basically thinking that, like, that makes sense. Every time, you know, Stan pulls out the bird book, he is entirely... And he's like, this is real, but this is apparently working. I'm going to keep doing this, because, you know what, it's working. And the one that throws me off a bit is Eddie Corcoran. When he gets chased by the monster from the Blue Lagoon, and he's like, I do not, like, this is, there's no way this is possible. He's actively saying, this is, there's no way this is happening. And he's absolutely fighting it. So that's where I'm, he still just gets slaughtered, right? Just decapitated. I think what what I'm pulling from what you were saying there, I agree, and that was more of a half believe. He was trying to convince himself to not believe it, which probably would have worked. If he actively could have shut it out and act- actually believed that he didn't believe, then maybe he could have gotten away, or it would never have even had a chance to get that close in the first place. So that that might make sense in my head. I don't know yet. And I, and I think that tracks with our idea of the kids are... Like almost like genetically predisposed to believe because they're children, but adults lose that ability as they get older. And so for the adult, because they lose that sense of wonder and magic belief and just in general, the awe of the world. And we've talked about this many times before, but therefore it's easier to get the kids because they always live in a state. They live in a constant state of half belief yes. all the time. It just takes whereas that adults, one bit of proof to pull them yes, in. Whereas adults live in a constant state of disbelief. Yeah. And so to try to get them even to half believing without taking them all the way. Pennywise needs them right in the middle, but he's got to be careful because, and that's probably hard for him because he's used to people just living in the middle or used, used to getting kids who live in the middle and then he can pull them over to and he can use it but he 
he needs to move the adults without moving them too far. And one way he can keep them in the middle is to distract them by giving them powers to worry about as well. To where, or instead, even if they don't believe. Yeah, or instead, but say they're they're on the f- path to full believing, but then power they have to deal with that. They can't actively think and brings their you know it, it's a, a weird you know mindset, but. I could see that working where he's like, this could, you know, distract them enough to where they still believe, but they don't, you know, they're not a threat. So we also see Bowers kind of show some signs of his old hardness. He kind of lays into Victor for a second here. And it's like the first, I think, actual his, uh, this is, this is Henry's first resurgence of old Henry a bit. Uh, we see the old hardness that made him their leader kind of come out a little bit it, with, with Victor there. Um, it, it seems like all of these characters are reverting in some ways. And, uh, this is the first indication that I got of him doing that. This is the first chapter we've had with grown up Bowers, but we, I feel like I got that feeling there. So here's the line on that, uh, don't talk about that, Henry shouted at Vic. And for a moment, all the preemptory hardness that had made him leader, made him their leader was in his voice. Then he cringed, thinking Vic would hurt him. Surely Vic could do whatever he wanted, since he was a ghost, but Vic only grinned. So, yeah, I mean, and that's what Pennywise slash Vic wanted. They wanted to get that leader back. They wanted to get that hardness drawn back out of him because he's his tool. Yep, keep provoking him until it showed up, right? All right, Ben, what else you got here? So, uh, kind of going back to my other comment, uh, so it's a super bog- boggart. Uh, as, you know, we said before, he can project different images to different people, but I believe this is the first instance where we get confirmation of simu- simultaneous visions. So, uh, Benny is laying in bed, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry, not Benny, uh, it was, who was the one that saw him, uh, Jimmy. Jimmy was laying in bed, looked up, saw, uh, Henry walking with Vic, but he, what he saw was him, Henry walking with his mom, and he starts screaming, no ma, no ma, no ma, and as the TV went off, Koontz comes in and sees Bauer standing there, but standing next to him is a clown with a Doberman pitcher's head. So you have Jimmy screaming, seeing mom, you have Henry seeing Vic, and you have Koontz seeing a Doberman Pinscher clown Mm -hmm. all at the same time. Now, I know uh, it did make me think of the Bill and Richie scene where it switched perspective, but we never got that actual at the exact same time. You're seeing this and you're seeing that it was implied, but this is the first time I think that we can guarantee where he can multifacet hit different mentalities and different fears. And, uh, you know, it's the only thing that's close to that is the reunion, but then everyone else can see everyone else's thing too. So that's a similar skill set, different application. So, but I'm with you. And then also he's being friendly to one and evil to two others. Mm -hmm. So he can differentiate that. So it's not just a one piece entity kind of thing. As in like, I'm scaring everybody and I'm just gonna, they're gonna project their, what they see on me. No, I can change what I'm doing and how I'm interacting based on each different person. So he's a bogger. He's Galadriel because he can talk to everybody in their own head simultaneously. Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm adding that to the list. Okay. He's a horcrux, so I'm sticking with that one. I horcrux. like that one a lot. <laughs> so, uh, I really feel like he just needs to get like the Lord of Light behind him, and then we've got all the fandoms. <laughs> <laughs> this book came out 12 years before any of those yeah. Song of Ice and Fire books came out. Yeah, but, We'll find it. But we'll, we'll make it happen. Harry Potter was, <laughs> maybe maybe uh, they'll go across a very narrow sea. <laughs> maybe. A, a, a narrow canal. <laughs> <laughs> It's very so, eerie. so I have one final note on uh, this section, and I've had this note for about four months now, sitting here waiting. We've actually known about this escape since Bill's chapter before the reunion in the car ride with Dave. They talked about a mentally mental patient who supposedly dangerous escaping from Juniper Hill, mm-hmm. and he had escaped the night before Bill had arrived. And so I've had this note. I'm like, I'm like, okay, come on. I'm like, I can't put it into that chapter because that I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was very interesting and well put in. Like you, I'm, I'm sure Luke, you probably didn't pick up on it or remember that. No, now, I just but. figured it was serious black. <laughs> <laughs> True. Right. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, we've known about this for two or three chapters now. No, I'm, I'm, like it's- it feels like that was a long time ago. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, but I did, and that was that was only three chapters ago. Two, I mean, two chapters ago. Right. 
Yeah. Well, 10, 11, this is the third chapter since is what I was getting at. But mentally, I'm three chapters ahead now. <laughs> and it was... Arcade math with me, I can't even. Calendar math is different, okay? <laughs> I don't like calendar <laughs> math. But uh, I'm glad that I, I saw this note while I was taking my notes, and I went back and, and listened and read that, that part again. I was like, oh. Yep, sure enough, there it is. That's pretty fucking obvious, like perfectly timed that it was the day before they actually get there and he's dealing with the cabbie. I was uh, I was glad you put that in there. So, it is now time for our IT fanboy and Stephen King veteran to give the new reader some questions. What do you guys got for me? All right, so I have two. My first one was, who exactly was killed by Henry? If anybody. I, right. I th- There's a lot of, uh, the way it's all worded, I looked at it a couple times. B- before I even saw your question, because I was like, because, again, when I first went through it all, I kind of missed a few things on that first read As through. You do. Listen through. That's why I listened to it four or five times at different speeds. And, um... <laughs> Like, the first time through, I was like, oh, wow, okay, so he actually did all these things. Like, I just had that in my head, because that's the thing that stands out, is him saying, yeah, I did that, like, that is fine, yep, I'll admit these things, I did those. Like, that's what you get out of it on the cursory view, the service Mm -hmm. level view. Mm -hmm. And then you get into it, and, yeah, I don't know if he actually killed his dad. It sounds like that one might have just been pinned on him, which I, I don't know anything else about that. I'm trying to... Think back if there's been anything else about Henry's dad since the Mike interlude where Mike's dad had to deal with him. Um, but I don't know that we knew he was dead at this point. It, I feel like it's been referenced, but we don't have any detail on it. Um, I, I do. I don't think that he killed Chris and uh, Huggins. Ouch. Belch, I think he can kind of accept that one as taking kind of responsibility for it as their okay. leader. I, similar to if any of the losers would have been killed, Bill would have t- felt yeah. that responsibility. I think there are some similarities there on he is the natural leader and would he even says it himself, he's like, I, I can accept that because I, I took him down there. So, right. But I don't think he actually did it by his hand. Um he explained away the Hoxtetter belt that he won it in a game of, what do you say, scat? Or whatever he called it. Yeah, um, back in like April or something. And so, like, I don't think he had a hand in that one. Veronica, I'll say he probably did, because he doesn't know what happened there. Or, like, he, since that's the one that he can't just explain away, I feel like that's the one that he probably had a hand in. Okay. Veronica Grogan. I, it could be all of them. Hell, he probably killed his dad. Like, that's... Honestly, that's probably the one that makes the most sense. <laughs> All right. My last question for you is, did you know before this chapter that Henry was part of the big under the city thing? Whatever that thing is. I feel like that's been brought up before that those three bullies had a part to play down there. So maybe, I don't know, I, I'd i have to go back and... And think about it, but uh. But I mean, as you were reading at this time, didn't I wasn't surprised like- at all. Not, not, okay. not at all. Like I was like that. Yeah, that I, it, it definitely tracks, and it, it feels like I've heard that before. Okay, and that was all I was wondering. Just yeah, like did it feel like new information, or did it feel like something jumping out at you? No, it felt very much like they have a role to play down there, like okay. the uh, Weber, Unwin, and Dubé did in okay. Chapter Two. Sounds good. So for. Questions or comments from the new reader? Uh, we've, I think we've kind of already unpacked this, um, and I wasn't e- expecting to get as clear of a thought process out of it that I did with, with your guys' help. So thank you for that. But uh, it comes down to the, they can't hurt you, Henry said, understanding he was talking to more than Vic. They can't hurt me if they only half believe. So it was the whole discussion of half believing versus fully believing versus not believing mm-hmm. thing that I, it stuck with me because that's been a big thing throughout all of these interactions with Pennywise. And uh, I, I think we got a, a pretty strong case built up on how it's going to go. How it's going to be. When you don't know Pennywise anymore. All right, let's get into our favorite things, Ben. Well, my new, fav- my new favorite thing might be the It Rock you've just started. But- <laughs> it Rock? <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, yeah, the It Blossoms, you know. We've got, uh, 
Penny, <laughs> Penny Wise Lane is in my ear. <laughs> oh, I was singing, flow to my sewer. <laughs> you will flow to <laughs> You're coming home. <laughs> really, we could just sing 99 Red Balloons and not really have to change much. <laughs> that is, that's what it's about. I'm pretty confident in that. <laughs> Especially in the original language. <laughs> All right, Ben. So what was your favorite thing this chapter? Uh, my favorite thing this chapter was uh, Henry actually owning up and admitting to the murders, even though he might not have committed all of or most of them. Uh, showing kind of growth on his part, uh, up to that point, uh, actually letting the mental, you know, the mental health, so, you know, association actually work. I mean, granted, it was in a very underhanded and it, it, it was in a very underhanded and bad way, but it worked to kind of calm him down of his evilness, at least on a cursory level. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Melissa? Even an idiot like Henry knew that in Derry, night never ended because he gets it. Mm hmm. I feel like he, we've touched on this, that he remembers everything mm -hmm. that he experienced. Mm -hmm. Mike has a lot more information than anybody else, but that's come through effort. This and is he just, still has two weeks missing. Right. This is just experience. This is just, he knows it. And I wonder if that's more of a part of, he was one of the tools. He was, he was on Pennywise's team until he, as Benji kind of pointed out earlier, potentially fought back or didn't want to be anymore. I'd say lost the connection. That's, that's fair. So right, um, now, now I'm picturing Pennywise Letterman jackets. I'm good. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing here is the whole discussion that we've kind of already gone through, but it start, it stems from the line, I, t I can take care of them if they only half believe. That whole discussion is something that's been swirling around in my it hunt for, <laughs> for all of these episodes, and uh, this felt like confirmation on a lot of thoughts that I had that I didn't quite have a good way of putting into words. Like, I've been trying very unsuccessfully, but I think this is this is kind of what I've been... So, like, overall feeling, and it, it seems like it... It's, it feels... It's like a good confirmation for me that, yeah, that's a big part of why... Not necessarily why, but the, the tool that needs to be used to fight Pennywise, or why Pennywise has such power over some, but not others. So... I feel like we're getting a pretty big theme, thematic thing through through that that whole idea there. Well, that wraps us up for this episode. You can follow us on social media at floats down here on Twitter and Instagram. Send us messages there. You'll most likely talk to Benji because I can't look at it. <laughs> uh, send us an email to floatsdownhere at gmail.com. Check out all of our shows at the podcast.com, including Game of Thrones, Podcast That Drinks and Knows Things, future shows that are coming out now, very, very soon, actually, the podcast that fights in F Words Outlander series, and the oldie but goodie, the podcast that must not be named Harry Potter Extravaganza. Subscribe, rate, like, leave comments on iTunes and YouTube. We would really, really appreciate it. And also, uh, we launched this a little while back, but we do have a Patreon for anybody that would like to support us. Uh, it would go a long way to helping us out. We can promote... Uh, create more new material and keep everything going smoothly uh any you know anything we always appreciate uh all the help and uh love and support from everybody but if you would like to find and uh, support us you can get us at patreon.com slash stay imaginary uh we have some great uh benefits and uh perks and everything uh a couple different groups uh, that you can join with get uh show notes or uh, get call outs and a few others that I know I'm not mentioning right now, but go to the our Patreon page, find out and just help us out if, if you'd like. If not, thank you for listening. We will see you again in two weeks when we continue chapter 12, sections 3, 4, and 5. You'll flow too. Stay imaginary. Thanks. Alright, I super like not having to do any of that. I had to do it for six episodes, so yay. <laughs>